Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening to some of you who are joining us from halfway around the world. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Ayers, and I'm Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs. I am delighted to welcome everyone to another event in our book launch series. This series, as many of you know, offers uh, a special opportunity to the George Washington University community and the public to meet our award-winning faculty and hear in their own words about the issues and questions their respective books explore. So today we are going to be celebrating and discussing the challenges of technology and economic catch-up in emerging economies. This is just out from Oxford University Press. This edited volume brings together five co-editors from the United States, South Korea, United Kingdom, and Russia, who in turn worked with another 25 of the most prominent academics from all over the world on the subject of technology, innovation, and economic development as chapter contributors. All told, this book represents the culmination of a five-year effort. I would like to note that this volume is Dr. Nick Menorcas's 11th book. He is the director of the Elliott School's Institute for International Science and Technology Policy, and he is a professor of economics and international affairs here at the Elliott School. He is also the Sao Paulo Excellence Chair in Technology and Innovation Policy at the Universidad Estadual de Campinas, UNICAM, as well as a leading research fellow at the Institute for Statistical Studies and Economics of Knowledge in the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow. His interests center around industrial organization, the economics of technological change, technology and innovation policy and strategy, and R&D program evaluation. He is an editor of the journal Science and Public Policy and holds a PhD in economics from New York University. Professor Venortes has co-edited this collection with four other scholars, all highly regarded academics internationally, representing top-ranked universities in their respective countries. The University College of London, National Research University, Higher School of Economics in Russia, and Seoul National University in Korea. We are also joined today by Kun Lee. He's a professor of economics at Seoul National University in Seoul, Korea, and a fellow of the CIFAR IEP program. He is a previous winner of the Schumpeter Prize and the CAP Prize. He is an editor of research policy and associate editor of industrial and corporate change and served previously as the president of the International Schumpeter Society. Uh, previously also served as a member of the Committee for Development Policy of the UN and a member of the World Economic Forum Global Futures Council. He is currently serving as vice chair of the National Eco Economic Advisory Council for the President of Korea. And he holds a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. We are also joined today by co-editor Dirk Meissner, distinguished professor and head of the International Laboratory for Economics of Innovation in the Institute for Statistical Studies and Economics of Knowledge at the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Russia. He is an associate editor of the journals Technological Forecasting and Social Change, IEEE Transactions on Engineering Management, and Intellectual Capital. His research interests include science, technology, innovation policy, and commercialization. He holds a PhD from Dresden University Institute of Technology. We are joined as well by Slavo Radosevic, who is Professor of Industry and Innovation Studies at University College London. He is visiting professor at National Research University Higher School of Economics at St. Petersburg. His research focuses on the economics of technological change and innovation studies, as well as growth and structural change through innovation systems and entrepreneurship. And he has provided expert advice to the European Commission, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, UNESCO, UNIDO, the World Bank, and several governments in Central and Eastern Europe. He holds a PhD from the University of Zagreb. And we are also joined by Zhong Dong Li, who is a professor in the College of Engineering at Seoul National University. He is also a special advisor to the President of Korea on economy and science. His research focuses on the use of network economics and the social effects of network technologies. And he holds a PhD in science and telecommunications from Seoul National University. So those are our five co-editors who indeed all of our chapter editors in today's volume have experience advising governments, industry, and international organizations all over the world. So you can see that they bring a policy-focused perspective to this work. So at its core, this book is about the challenges of technology upgrading or the process of enhancing the technological capabilities of firms, sectors, and countries in emerging economies. 
The essays in this volume consider the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and other emerging markets such as Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Mexico, Chile, Kenya, and others. Contributors look at ways to measure innovation, challenges of leapfrogging and what makes leapfrogging possible, consideration for global value chains as they've emerged, the middle income trap, conditions like education and governance that support innovation, and forward-looking issues like whether technology can help countries develop differently and in a more sustainable way. These are just a few of the many considerations this wide-ranging collection explores. So I look forward to hearing more from all of our panelists today about these and other questions of technology and development. So with that, I will now hand the floor over to Professor Venortas, who is going to introduce our outside commentators on the volume and who will kick us off with his reflections on technology upgrading and economic catch-up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Alex. you. Um, One little question. Can I stand or, or I talk from here? Here. Yeah, I prefer to be there. Okay, I guess. If it is not possible, it's okay. It'll be easier. Don't worry about it. All right, very good. Uh, so, um, Thank you, Alisa. Uh, this is a great honor for, uh, for us all. Um, the Elliott School is, uh, is one of the top uh, schools of international affairs in, in the country, and, and having a book of this, of this type um, is, is really very, 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 very exciting for us. I want to start by thanking my colleagues, and, and, and I will say a few words of how, how this book became a reality, actually. Uh, but my colleagues who are all online, all, all four co-editors are, are, are really great. So <clears throat> we all know, it's very well known now, every, every government around the world knows, every company around the world knows that economic growth and technological advancement and innovation are tightly linked. So, so if the technology upgrading, if you don't change, if you don't keep changing, if you don't upgrade your industries, um, if you fall behind in technology, it means that your growth is going to suffer. So um, starting from this principle um, and from the fact, from the observation that uh, many, many countries actually get stuck somewhere along the way. And very few of those who try um, ever make it, uh, are able to close the gap with the, with the, with the ones at the top. Um, we start thinking about this, and it was actually in October 2016, I believe, or November, when um, when um, um, a big conference uh, was organized in Moscow, Russia, and one of, of the co-editors, J.D. Lee, John Dong, uh, came and gave actually a very interesting talk. Um, he was uh, saying that uh, uh, the first stage, the sweat stage, uh, uh, is where most countries go and they can, they can actually do that fairly well. But it is the second stage when they actually pass from the, from the middle level income to the high level income, where you need to change your capabilities into what he talked about, design capabilities, innovation, basically, original innovation. It's where, where most people, more, most countries fail. We thought it was very interesting. And, and the same night, another editor, the local editor, Dirk Meissner and myself and JD, uh, talked a little bit about this. this. This is a very interesting idea. I mean, of course, there is a lot of literature on this, but he was presenting it in a new way. We said, right, maybe, maybe a book, uh, maybe the time for a book. The next question came very quickly. Who else? Uh, I mean, is there? Who are the other people? Then definitely we we came to the other next two editors, right? Um, Kyung Lee is a major personality. He has been the the, the president of the Schumpeter Society. He has he is uh, actually an editor of the very top journal in our field. Such policy is the the top journal. Um, he is a, a good friend and. Over the years, we knew him. He had visited Campinas uh, before, so uh, definitely Kun. We would ask Kun, and then Slavo Radosevic is uh, uh, probably the top expert in transition economies, uh, the economies of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. So Slavo is also a good friend and collaborator. We asked him. Both likely said yes. <laughs> so. Uh, what happened then, it was a natural, natural thing. Each of these people used their networks. So we reached the very top, very top, some of the very top 
people around the world. And, and we were very lucky that very few declined. Uh, maybe one or two uh, said no for various reasons, but everybody else accepted to work on this. So we start working on this somewhere in uh, 2017. Then, um, then what happened is that uh, in 2019, uh, Campinas, the University of Campinas, where, where we have a general's grant by the, by the state of uh, Sao Paulo, uh, FAPESPI actually, uh, the, the, the research foundation of the state, um, uh, helped us organize a major, major event where all these people were writing all these chapters, um, plus others like uh, Otaviano, who, who had roles of, uh, and actually Anwar, who is who's here with us, uh, who have roles of comment, commenting on, on the chapters came along. Um, major event for the university in Brazil to collect all these people at once in one room, hundreds of people in. And we, we, the whole event was around those, those uh, chapters of the book. So this was the place where the first version of the chapters were presented, uh, comments and, and so forth. And then, and then the final, the final uh, act of this is uh, last year, November, December of 2020, January, February, March or April of this year, we had five international events uh, online where, where the final versions of the chapters were presented. Um, and, 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 and then the, 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 the book moved towards uh, publication, actually. We got the last comments, people from all over the world. And, 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 and what you've got is, is this, this volume. Let me say that one, one observation. When we were writing this, actually, when we started this operation, we did not, COVID was nowhere to be seen, right? Um, there was no COVID then. It was, uh, there were the usual problems of the, I mean, of the, of the developing countries, of the emerging economies, but then COVID came along during the production of the book and it changed uh, a lot of things. Um, the chapters do not reflect very much COVID because they were, they were designed and produced uh, uh, before the first versions, but but really the problems, the issues that COVID has uh, presented to to our societies are reflected in the, in the book because uh, COVID, for example, um, created uh, the need for resilience. We have a huge reorganization of international investment now around the world, exactly because we learned some lessons from COVID about resilience, and 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 that is that is very much reflected in the book. And, and, and the book has, uh, has uh, the, the, the interesting um, feature that it, it goes from the macro level to the micro level. It has case studies uh, from emerging economies and, and it has issues that are very critical today. For example, the chapter of inclusion. Mm -hmm. How for the first time now here, Tadiano is one of the best economies that there are out there, uh, but uh, it's around it's a, one of the first times that we start thinking about the topic of inclusion uh, together with structural change in economics. We, have, we don't have this. We have a lot of literature on structural change, how economies change their structure, right? but we don't link it to inclusion. And, and this book has one of the first, first pieces on that, on that thing. So <clears throat> without, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our two speakers here um, for today. And let me look at my notes because uh, he told me uh, I have very interesting things on my left here. Um, I have Otaviano Canuto. Um, he's a professional lecturer uh, with our Latin American program here at the Elliott School, but uh, he's uh, much more. Um, so he's, uh, he's currently senior fellow of the uh, policy center of the New South uh, in Morocco. Um, but uh, before he was a vice president of the World Bank, uh, he was executive director of the IMF. He was vice president of the Inter-American Development Bank. <laughs> um, he was professor at the, uh, the University of Campinas some time ago. Um, and also he was professor of the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, 
um, some time ago. And um, he was Deputy Minister for International Affairs uh, of the Ministry of Finance of Brazil. So we have a person here, a very accomplished person, and, and we are very lucky that he is with us at the Elliott School. Um, we are hoping to recruit him as associate of our institute. We are trying very hard now. <laughs> 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 and then and then we have uh, Anwar Aridi, who is uh, online. He's joining us from Seoul. Um, Anwar is Lebanese by birth. Um, he is a product of our program. Um, so he did the master's, his master's in the International Science and Technology Policy Program here. And then he moved to, he liked it so much that he moved to Trachtenberg School, where he did his PhD with me. Um, on science and technology policy, um, the, 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 the subject of the doctoral dissertation was the, the role of um, <clears throat> the diaspora, uh, the diaspora in moving knowledge around the world and helping developing countries. And now he is a representative of the World Bank in, in Korea. Right? He's an expert, an expert in science, technology and entrepreneurship. And he is also before the posting in Korea, he was uh, posted in Sofia, Bulgaria, and, and because he, he, he understands that part, that part of the world as well in Eastern Europe. So without further ado, I will, let's start with Otaviano. Um, great, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, well, as Nick uh, correctly said, I had the, the privilege of accompanying uh, at least the debates preliminary debates and some of the debates on the chapters uh, this time online. And I think this book is a masterpiece and uh, because it puts the hat, the frontier of, of our knowledge in, in some very important topics as, as Nick uh, aptly described in his talk. See, uh, it reduced the economists' ignorance on uh, to quote the debates uh, 50 years ago about the measurement of, of the economist's ignorance when it came to total factor productivity. Uh, just to remember ourselves, uh, in the first exercise of uh, macroeconomic accounting, uh, the GDP, the gross domestic product, uh, was attributed to different factors of production, capital, labor, Nowadays, thanks to the measurement of natural wealth by the World Bank, you can do this including to natural capital. But there is always, there was always uh, an important component of GDP that could not be explained by the factors of production. That's why those Abramovitz call that the measure of our ignorance. <laughs> now, uh, it became clear how uh, technology and technological development was very much an important variable to explain that unknown of productivity. Okay, then start uh, dealing with technology, trying to measure uh, facts and determinants and so on. But another important component of this equation is how do you get the technological development? And then there was a whole literature that came to be known as the evolutionary literature, trying to explain the micro determinants of uh, how uh, you know the production function of a country exhibited those components of a total factor productivity, and also uh, it became clear. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about something that is mainstream in the sense that you know, uh, it, unfortunately, this is not present and acknowledged in in many uh, courses of economics. Uh, it became clear the relevance of capabilities of intangible assets of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, components, uh, the tacit and idiosyncratic components of, uh, in the formation of capabilities in order to get to the technological capabilities and then the, uh, the object of our <laughs> measured ignorance. So this book builds on, on, on this. Uh, literature and push ahead our frontier 
not only with respect to, to the understanding of technology capability, information development, and so on, uh, but also uh, it highlights the role, the important role of complementary factors of what needs to be in place in terms of business environment, in terms of other uh, components, so as to induce the agents to, uh, to invest in, in those capabilities. And it also uh, calls attention to the specificity of, uh, of countries along their stage of evolution in between low income levels uh, until the successful ones uh, reach high income levels. Uh, it does this, as uh, Nick said, approaching several caves, in particular, uh, received Brazil and, and Brazilian and, and South Korean case uh, received uh, very much detailed attention. And so uh, it moves us a step forward in that regard, uh, collecting and, and analyzing concrete experience where it failed, where it succeeded, why, and so on. So it goes from macro to micro, uh, encompassing all this into the institutional texture. And it goes, it finalized by trying exactly proposing policy lessons. So it adds to our knowledge on, on uh, what it works and uh, what should be paid attention by, by countries, particularly taking into account the stage of development where they are. So it, it, it's you, you, it's technological capabilities, middle income trap, everything is there and, and well done and with a concrete case. I personally have, uh, uh, I not only uh, became appreciative of the book uh, uh, as I had the opportunity to watch some of those preliminary debates, but I have also a personal kink with this. My own uh, PhD thesis 30 years ago, 30 years ago, 91, uh, was on Brazil and South Korea. Uh, why is that at the time? Uh, clearly, Brazil had inflected down in its growth trajectory uh, after the, the loss of the gate. And South Korea, that uh, displayed. Uh, some features by the turn of the 80s to the uh, by the turn of the 70s to the 80s with Brazil also suffered a, 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 a debt crisis, but it managed to move on and was on the way up. Uh, 30 years later, oh, and I attributed at the time uh, an important weight to the structure of incentives uh, embedded in, in industrial policies in the two countries. Uh, at the time, I nicknamed uh, the, the type of industrial policy followed in, in Korea as uh, 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 helping the winners and punishing the losers. That's how the shable uh, became uh, uh, so important. Whereas in Brazil, you had helping winners and helping the losers. So there was no selection, no incentives for making the economic agents to invest that much in capability approaches. And, uh, and to a large extent, uh, what we, uh, you know, 30 years later, uh, unfortunately, my thesis was right. Was right. Uh, but, uh, but of course, not with the, the, the depth and with the, the coverage that the chapters of this book and the whole framework Provides provides one to understand how those things are made. So, in a nutshell, I would strongly recommend uh, this book uh, for anyone interested in economic development and economic growth. The interest goes beyond uh, simply the countries that are treated there. It, it, it's a it pushes the frontier line of our understanding. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you, Ottaviano. I think uh, we should uh, pass uh, directly to uh, Anwar Aridi, uh, who will talk to us from Seoul. Anwar? Thank you, Nick. Uh, it's an honor to join you today at this uh, important book launch, and good to see many familiar faces. Um, 
I would like to focus my remarks on key, key policy debates uh, that are pertinent to emerging economies, economic and technological catch up, which makes this volume and its content a valuable intellectual and practical resource for policymakers and development practitioners like ourselves at the bank. Um, casted as contemporary challenges in the book, nevertheless, I believe that these challenges represent potential opportunities that will define the catch-up path or characterize the bypass route, namely digitization and its ramification on productivity and inclusion, and industrial leadership as a source of future economic growth in these countries. I'll start with the first policy debate. Um, how can developing economies stand to benefit from the emerging technological paradigm represented by the accelerated and economy-wide digitization, a trend further accelerated during the pandemic? What are the promises and threats of the new general purpose technologies represented in AI, machine learning, big data analytics, and robotics, and its implications to catching up economies and their effort to seize a perfect moment for leapfrogging, detouring, kicking away the ladder and ballooning, to borrow some of the catchy catching up economics lingo from the book. What better moment to bypass the forerunners when technological paradigms are shifting? Assuming that indeed a window of opportunity is opening up, few important issues need to be on the agenda of policymakers in emerging economies. First and foremost, the inclusivity of the structural change, or rather the lack of, despite their evident impact on improving competitiveness and productivity of businesses, digital technologies are not monolithic and their impacts vary by type of technology. The impact on market inclusion, i.e. in terms of productivity gap between large and smaller firms, as well as on geographical conversions in terms of concentration of economic activities in existing production hubs. As an example, industrial robots, AI, machine learning, cloud computing, do contribute to further divergence between larger and smaller firms and tend to foster geographical concentration because of the nature of production, which requires higher capital investments, scale and access to talent pools to achieve efficiency gains. Whereas adoption of basic CRMs and ERP systems and basic platform technologies tend to reduce the productivity gap and disproportionately benefit smaller firms and contribute to convergence due to their low cost of entry. Thus, beyond the general and overarching objective of national digital transformation strategies and slogans, policymakers do have choices to make and tensions to acknowledge when designing policies targeting digital adoption and dissemination within their economies. So acknowledging the potential inclusivity challenge, emerging economies need to also get the basics right to be even part of the race. Digital Essentials 101 before Industry 4.0. How to provide economy-wide access to digital opportunity through affordable and reliable broadband while maintaining that this access is leveraged for productivity improving activities. It is important to note here that access to digital opportunity does not automatically translate into diffusion or effective use if complementarity factors are not secured. Here, the agendas of digital payment, analog logistics, and last mile delivery challenges for e-commerce, e-government, and other complementarities come to play. Second essential, maintaining contestable digital markets. How to promote e-commerce and the emergence of domestic platform economy while ensuring that SMEs and entrepreneurs are not left behind and or discriminated against by anti-competitive practice of digital incumbents. How to adapt competition policy for the digital age and new forms of market dominance emerging in digital markets, such as self-preferencing. This is important to ensure that capable entrepreneurs and startups, potential disruptors can enter the market, scale, compete with digital incumbents. And lastly, but most importantly, skills, skills, skills. 
how to ensure adequate supply of digitally skilled labor. While basic digital skills are required for all workers, advanced skills are required in key sectors of the digital economy. How to reskill and upskill the labor force to meet the growing demands for specialized labor. Here, a rethinking and recalibration of the education and training system, including tertiary and vocational training, to meet these demands are essential to maintaining competitiveness and be able to win the race. The second policy debate, uh, which is also as important and related, how are the technology trends changing the feasibility and desirability of manufacturing-led development? Should the focus stay on manufacturing and what is the promise of service-led development? Almost all the decline in agricultural share of total employment in low and middle income economies since the 1990s was offset by services. Services today are expanding with digitization and intersectoral linkages. Evidence from recent World Bank flagship report on services sector show that services increasingly matter for the manufacturing competitiveness, account for much of the value added in a product and themselves are a source of dynamic gains and employment. So what does this mean? This is important as it relates to learning and consequently catching up. Traditionally, the manufacturing story uh, uh, goes as following. Upgrading starts with OEMs by licensing the production of foreign technologies, firms develop engineering capabilities and become uh, ODMs enter markets with their own products as original brand manufacturing, and this is the traditional story. So how applicable is this framework to understanding manufacturing today or manufacturing tomorrow, especially as the sector continues its evolution driven by increased digitization and smartization? The new manufacturing technologies are forcing the design process to change to manufacturing for design. This ultimately has consequences on the geography of production and the workforce education, which needs to be closer to and incorporated into the design process. Subsequently, how can these dynamics and realities be reflected into the design of policy support instruments? What kind of support instruments respond to the increasing serviceification in the manufacturing sector? Traditional focus on manufacturing and agriculture have led to instruments favoring investments in capital and machinery rather than intangible capitals, which are the drivers of innovation in the services sector. Actually, the experience from Korea's smart manufacturing program is illuminating in this regard. Evidence from recent work on the program shows that mere adoption of digital technologies by manufacturers does not always translate to better performance. The process of internalizing adopted digital technologies, which leads to smartization, is a more fundamental source of competitive advantage than the technology itself. Finally, for developing countries to catch the digital wave, effectively upgrade their technological capabilities, and seize the catch-up or reroute opportunities, they need to focus on adopting digital technologies across the firms and sectors, but also on openness to trade and services, regulation of data and data sharing, investing in skills and reskilling, and ensuring availability of complementarity conditions for tech and digital upgrading. As the book rightly emphasizes, successful technology upgrading is not a passive, autonomous process, but rather involves active and coordinated activity coordinated by a variety of state and non-state actors. Upgrading is possible when strategic intention of catch-up is accompanied by a well-designed plan for leapfrogging, end of quote. Thus, in the age of new industrial policy, the reassertion of the role of the state and the rise of strategic industrial innovation policy, what policies would work in terms of building technological capabilities for catch-up is a matter of vision, policy experimentation and learning and effective policy implementation. Not an easy feat, but as they say, slow but steady upgrading wins the race. With this, I'll end and uh, congratulations to the esteemed author for a very timely, rich and needed book. Thank you for inviting me and looking forward to the discussion.
Thank you, Anwar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> you may be happy to, 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 to learn actually that my 12th book is going to be on intangible assets. Um, <laughs> it has started already. Um, so that is an extremely important point. Before we go to the discussion, I think uh, we should um, open a little bit to the to the co-editors. My co-editors are online. Uh, if you guys uh, want to, unfortunately, they're only guys. Sorry. <laughs> this, um, if you guys want to 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 mention something, Kuhn, JD, Dirk, Slavo. Okay, if I uh, add something, uh, Ning mentioned at the beginning the issue of COVID-19 were not that much I mean, the, uh, covered in the book, but uh, in nowadays general finding is that country with better technological capability or especially digital technology are doing better in terms of uh, coping with COVID challenges. So in that sense, our book's emphasis on capability is still uh, relevant in this post uh, pandemic period. Secondly, the Anna rightly mentioned the importance of service sectors. Uh, we agree that our book does not much uh, devote to the uh, issue of service sectors other than manufacturing, but um, nowadays uh, the, the boundary between manufacturing and service are getting somewhat blurred. So that's a role of uh, digital technology which try to combine various segments of industries to make uh, more value added possible. And that's the uh, maybe key issues uh, uh, which should be dealt to more in uh, follow-up studies, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Kion. Anyone else from the, from the editors? Yes, so please unmute. Somebody is speaking. I think they're having trouble unmuting. Oh, okay. I just unmuted. Now it works. Uh, just coming back to the COVID-19 uh, too, we didn't consider that in the book, uh, but I think what we found in the book indeed, uh, it has been become much more visible in line with the COVID-19 pandemic over the last, now I mean by two years. Um, I believe certainly also what will happen after the pandemic is over, but we will see an increase in catch up and we might also see a shift of power in countries. So we might see different countries catching up a little bit later because they're now catching up. They caught up uh, in many, many cases and the competition will certainly change from now innovation driven competition towards education competition. Um, in our established developed countries, I believe we have the problem about educational systems uh, which are differently designed in the Asian countries or the Eastern European or the Latin American countries. But as Anwar rightly pointed out, it's all about skills and competences. Uh, and that is the point. Uh, if a country wants to maintain a certain power, wants to maintain uh, a certain level of wealth and competitiveness, it requires the force of the skilled labor. And this labor is uh, an issue of education and it starts in the educational systems at the primary school and even before. So that is a paradigm shift away from classical standard industrial and innovation policy towards a more holistic picture, uh, which considers the labor skill and the, the, the skill space and the competences um, and how they are trained and integrated when in the manufacturing process eventually. So that creates innovation, but where it comes from. Uh, I think that is what we clearly see now during the pandemic, despite uh, some tendencies towards protectionism, trade wars, and things like that. But after that is over, uh, we will go into the competition for education and, and skills. So that's all from my side so far. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, JD, Slavo. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. JD, you go. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make uh, one uh, the topic that we did not explicitly cover in this issue, uh, in this volume, is that uh, the current uh, very hot US-China technology hegemony competition and also the global value chain 
uh, changing the landscape of global value chain. But I think uh, the, all the discussion contained in this volume may have some implication for that kind of technology competition among countries. If, uh, if one country do not, uh, does not have any kind of uh, its own technological capability, whether it is an implementation or, or design, but uh, if one country does not have that kind of capability, uh, maybe the country may not have any kind of a ticket to be part of the show to make a new uh, landscape. So in that sense, our book has some still uh, implication. And I just wanted to have one more general uh, comment is that uh, I wanted to emphasize that the sequence of the chapter is arranged intentionally uh, to make this edited book uh, look more like a, a book written by a single author. It starts from the theoretical perspectives and national level evidence and goes to country cases, including the emerging issues. Uh, and also it ends with the uh, policy implication. And thus, um, maybe I expect authors can choose any, any one chapter depending on uh, their interest, which has research interest, but also students, especially the graduate students can have a better image or holistic understanding of the uh, capability operating issue if uh, they can read the chapters from one to 16. That's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you, JD. <laughs> Slavo. Yeah, uh, the objective of the book was to give a state of the art at a specific point in time, obviously. You know, of course, at the moment you finish the book, then you see, my God, there is uh, so many opportunities for something new which is emerging. But I think this is a very good, uh, a reflection of the state of the art of uh, you know one two years ago of course in the meantime there are new uh, issues emerging but that's inevitable nature of academy you will be always uh, running the, the the target which is ahead of you anwar is absolutely right the digitalization is one huge issue but i'm somehow less worrying about that because what i'm doing recently shows me that there is a close correlation between these two processes of course it, it changes the nature of technology upgrading but it's highly compatible but for me, much bigger challenge for, for any future project is then looking at the greening of economies of a kind of uh, environmental technologies, diffusion of that and technology upgrading, which for these middle income economies is not obvious that there is a kind of uh, um, mutually enhancing relationship. So that is for me, you know, kind of one of, of the major challenges for the future. But I think uh, as one of the authors, I'm, I'm quite happy that we managed to, to provide the state of the art at one point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Slavo. Alisa, it's all yours. I'd love to follow this up with a question for, for any of our co-editors or panelists today on the, the issue of leapfrogging, which is considered in uh, a number of the different chapters. What are the conditions that allow leapfrogging to successfully take place? May I direct this question to Kun Lee? <laughs> OK. Yeah, I'm the uh, one of the authors for the key chapter with the title, The Economics of Technological Leapfrogging. So what are the preconditions to try leapfrogging is that, uh, first of all, uh, you have to have a certain level of uh, uh, capability built already from past, past experiences. Otherwise, it's too, too risky to try leapfrogging strategy because you might fail unless you are I, I say that leapfrog is like flying a balloon. So uh, if you don't have a, a, a strong wing to fly, you might fall through the windows. People say leapfrog is uh, uh, utilizing new windows opportunity, but to fly out of window, we have to have a strong wing. So wing means getting prepared in terms of uh, several dimensions of technical capability. So that's the uh, uh, precondition. Uh, to try leapfrogging. Also, another condition is that um, you cannot try every time, but you have to wait for time that paradigm are shifting or changing or emergence of new paradigm, such as change from analog to digital technology or like current time of emerging new 
paradigms such as uh, renewable renew, re, such a, uh, renewed energy or energy revolution or industry 4.0, those are the time that try leapfrogging strategy with a better chance for success. In other words, you can wait for the, the, the paradigm shifting period. That's the best time to try leapfrogging. There's quite an extensive chapter uh, contributed by Professor Lee in the volume. So I encourage people to take a look at that. So we are open now for Q&A. If we have any questions here, uh, please wait for the mic so people online can hear you. Any questions um, from our online participants, please feel free to put that in the chat uh, and we can read your question out and ask any of our panelists to comment. Um, I'll follow up with another question, again, for any of our panelists who feel most comfortable asking this question or answering this question. That relates to the, the issue of global value chains. I mean, we, we talked about the fact that you uh, were working on this volume pre-COVID. Uh, one of the things that's happened post-COVID, of course, is a uh, uh, much tighter trade barriers environment, which makes it harder to establish or, or expand broader global value chains. At the same time, we see interest in many countries around the world in uh, bringing those value chains home and in building resilient value chains in their own countries. Is this possible? I mean, what does is, what is the theory of technology and development have to say about the idea of recreating value chains at home? Will that be possible in every place? Can I say something? This is a very important and contemporaneous topic. Uh, in fact, there is no uh, clearly economic rationale for that. Uh, yeah, but we had talks about it since the, uh, the tsunamis and, and, and the experience suffered by Japan. It, be, it became clear to everyone that while the existing global or regional value chains, they are the most efficient in, in terms of costs and uh, way of producing things. Uh, it was vulnerable to any shock happening on any of the links. And of course, uh, what happened during COVID, uh, put this COVID, the, the pandemic is not changing history, but it is accelerating history. And one of the faces of history that the pandemic is accelerating is this uh, wave of retrenchment from uh, globalization, uh, but we must keep in mind that there are two logics on this one. One is the private one. On the private side, each global value chain, the, the manager, will think twice, will measure uh, the trade off between efficiency in terms of costs, operating on a just in time base, uh, to another mode, which is just in case, where uh, the global value chains might create inventories along the line and or uh, near shore and or uh, inshore again. But this has cost, cost implications. Uh, the other logic is the one of the governments. Uh, definitely what happened during the pandemic uh, has led many governments now to think, well, we need to have some domestic production of medicines, of uh, medical equipment, semiconductors, and so on. Uh, and so this is a trend uh, that will, we will see where it goes, how far it goes. But the tendency is indeed the one of uh, retrenchment from the fully globalized, fully integrated global value chain that we watched uh, over the last decades. Which is a pity in some respects, because we know how the levels of poverty in the world, particularly in Asia, but not only there, came down as a, a, a part of globalization. So it's going to be harder now for other developing countries to, let's say, replicate the kind of strategy that the Asian countries managed to follow in the previous decades. Mm -hmm. the, the, the penultimate chapter of this book uh, is written by one of the foremost experts in global value change, and he's talking about policy. Uh, relating to global value chain. This is uh, Professor Pietro Belli, Carlo Pietro Belli from the University of Roma. Um, actually, Carlo was, was here. I met him here. He was uh, uh, for several years working for the Inter-American Development Bank. 
So he's an expert on Latin America as well. <laughs> and, 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 and in that chapter, actually, he goes into these kinds of issues, the changing nature of global value change. What does it mean for governments? Mm -hmm. in, in the view of many people, including myself, I think this is a huge opportunity for, for, um, for governments and for countries that are ready because of this realignment. This is opening an opportunity to capture some of that investment. If you, but you need to be ready, a little bit, not, not start from scratch. Do you have questions here in person? We've got one online. Let me uh, go ahead and read this out and then we'll, we'll find out who the right person is to take yeah. this one. Um, this is from Phoebe. Anwar mentioned about how to manage development as digitization is such an opportunity, but also a space controlled by large and dominant incumbents based in highly developed countries. Are there things policymakers and regulators in those highly developed countries should consider in thinking about these large multinationals that might also help economies trying to leverage digitization as well as their own local entrepreneurship? So it's about policy. Um, you, Anwar, maybe Anwar, you want to take this question? Um, sure, I guess the question is if there are policies related to existing incumbents that could help in the dissemination. Uh, maybe the other way to think about it is what's happening in uh, uh, economies where uh, uh, platform companies are uh, being battled or uh, attempted to make more space for smaller and uh, uh, smaller firms and entrepreneurs to enter into the market, whether it's in in the U.S. or in in Europe or in other markets. But most of our focus at the bank has been uh, at competition policy uh, fit for digital markets to ensure that. There is entry and contestability in the markets, given that the dynamics in these markets uh, are new and uh, related to self-preferencing and scale. So that necessitates updating competition policy to match these new dynamics and ensure that uh, a new entrants can enter the market and compete with incumbents. Yes, thank you which is a great question. Uh, there is an ongoing shift market power out of the traditional manufacturing system to the uh, technology, the digital companies and so on. Let me propose an exercise of science fiction. Uh, the way things, let's assume that the interest rates remain at low levels, uh, not go high. So money, credit remains available. Let me also assume that the evolution of production of capital goods uh, keeps uh, having lower prices. We may get to a point in which uh, well, any platform of those comes to me and says, you wanna become an industrial manufacturer? Well, yes, okay, here's a credit. Here are where you can, uh, I can lead to you machines and so on. Uh, the micro manufacturing is a possibility uh, now, increasingly so. And then you become a manufacturer at your garage, okay? Using 3D printing, using uh, uh, AI, uh, like a shoe factory in Atlanta that will, uh, is about to make shoes uh, based on the photo of your feet. And they will be able to produce the best shoe for, for your feet on a small scale individually. Well, in this case, uh, well, the precondition that the, the financier will make is that uh, one, the only condition is that your product is only commercialized through my platform. Okay. So paradoxically, you would have, let's say, uh, it would become easier to, to uh, uh, spread manufacturing activities. In a city like Sao Paulo, can you imagine how many micro manufacturers you could have of, of, of uh, many things. While at the same time, of course, the bulk of the profit margin would go to the platform. This is a, I, I, I mentioned this as a science fiction, but it's clearly something that we lie at. And, uh, and that's a challenge 
uh, nobody today uh, can say that they have the answer. Definitely, uh, the regulation, the public oversight will have to be extended to what happens in this market of platforms, which tends to be very much concentrated because of the economies of scale, the economies of scope, you're not bound to have multiple uh, Amazons. You you will have only uh, a small one. So this is, let's say, uh, the one of the major challenges I have coming from with the technological uh, evolution. And as we speak currently, uh, right now, as we speak, uh, China is attacking all its major uh, companies that are that are actually the platforms uh, provide the platforms in that country, uh, and and our. Uh, producers here, the five big companies, are all under the microscope of the antitrust division, mm -hmm. the Department of Justice, exactly for this reason, because there is a huge danger. And, and economists know this, actually, that the, 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 there is economic theory uh, that says why concentration happens in this industry. Uh, it's not new. So, so this, is, this is important, really, for developing countries because they will not have their platforms. They will need those platforms to, 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 to produce and they then will be captured by the platforms. It's very interesting. Can I follow up with a, a theme that recurs throughout many of the chapters in the book and that is the question of the middle income trap and the role of technology in helping countries overcome and move beyond the middle income trap. Um, one of the chapters, of course, talks about the need for different types of capabilities, a, 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 not only an implementation capability, but the design capability to surmount that. Can, in the few remaining minutes that we have left, can, can you talk a little bit about the importance of technology to getting beyond the middle income level? I think the best, the best person to answer this is J.D. Lee. <laughs> J.D.? Uh, excellent uh, question. Uh, so middle income trap is very maybe common um, maybe observation we can make. So what I uh, maybe uh, mention to mention is that before middle income trap, the country uh, would have focused on the implementation based basically the manufacturing capability. But in order to overcome the middle income trap, they need to change the paradigm or uh, the main capability uh, from manufacturing to uh, design, uh, including service. So uh, if one country fail to change that uh, the characteristics of capability, it will experience middle income trap. So in that sense, I call it as uh, not middle income trap, but middle innovation uh, trap to emphasize the importance of, of the transition of capabilities. Uh, it, 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 but we need to uh, focus one more trap before middle income trap. Uh, actually, we can say poverty trap. So very less, uh, develop the country should start anyhow. Uh, and then it goes to the before middle income trap and then it need to change the uh, capability uh, uh, types from implementation to, to design. So uh, in that sense, we can view the middle income trap from the perspective of uh, characteristics of uh, capability. You're dying to speak. No, no, no. no. Say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's brilliant. I, I wrote uh, many pieces about middle income trap, which is a concept that uh, was proposed by two former colleagues at World Bank uh, not long ago, 2000, you know, in a paper for, uh, about Malaysia in 2007. But if you Google middle income trap, the number, <laughs> it hit the name. And JD had this, uh, this additional important perception, uh, or I think it most likely uh, in Korea, uh, of uh, beyond the middle income trap, you have the middle innovation trap because you may succeed in going up the ladder, becoming a high income country, 
but you have to go from creatively adapting existing technologies to become a forerunner. That's the, the true essence of the big problem. And that the story has new determinants as he actually approached the field. That's a convention. Korea is an amazing country, right? Uh, at the end of the Korean War, South Korea was one but last in the pecking order of countries. So only one African country, I believe, was below Korea. Um, and right now it's number 10 with an with a economy in the world, right? And, and, and rising. But JD complains that it's not cut there yet before, uh, unless it overcomes the middle innovation. <laughs> it's, it's been one. Okay. So we are at our time. Uh, I hope everyone will join me in thanking and congratulating our co-editors and commenters and participants for uh, a superb volume that brings so much to the conversation about development, technology, and economic growth. I encourage people to take a look. Um, congratulations to you all. Thanks to all of our participants who joined us uh, remotely. Thanks to Zoom and thanks to the, the miracles of virtual engagement. We've had a conversation around the world. Thank you, everyone. One, one, last, uh, one last observation is the book is becoming open access yeah. uh, next June. Oh. So it will be an open access book for everybody around the world. Digitally available anywhere. Everywhere. Anywhere. That's great. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you.